Good evening to one and all. Assalamu alaikum, as we say in uh, Islam. Bill really dug deep. Uh, I sent a one page brief resume. <laughs> Most of this wasn't there. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for the um, honor of choosing me to speak on this occasion. Um, and uh, since I left scientific research and started the uh, farm project, I'm not really practiced in speaking as much as perhaps I used to be. So if I'm a little bit rusty, please excuse me. Um, I'm here today to help you commemorate and honor the memory of a great man one of many around the world, but his legacy speaks a lot to a large, large number of people w the world over. Archbishop Bishop, uh, Oscar Romero. So let me start with this slide and I hope um, the sound will project just fine. Let's see. I'd like to make an appeal in a special way to the men in the army. Brothers, each one of you is one of us. We are the same people. The farmers and peasants that you kill are your own brothers and sisters. When you hear the words of a man telling you to kill, think instead in the words of God. Thou shalt not kill. No soldier is obliged to obey an order contrary to the law of God. In his name, and in the name of our tormented people who have suffered so much and whose laments cry out to heaven, I implore you, I beg you, I order you, stop the repression! So, this was a dramatization, of course, from the movie. Um, but uh, it was very well done. Every one of us, at some point in our life, has to make a decision. You actually have to consciously decide to be on the side of God. And that means that you will put yourself in a position like this, possibly, and face what he faced. So, in my research about uh, Archbishop Romero, Oscar Arnulfo Romero Igaldamez. He spoke out against poverty, social injustice, the assassinations and the torture that were going on in El Salvador. He was assassinated while offering mass, as you heard before, in the chapel of the Hospital of Divine Providence in 1980. In 1997, Pope John Paul II bestowed upon Romero the title of Servant of God. He declared him a martyr on, uh, Pope Francis declared him a martyr on the 3rd of February, 2015. And Archbishop Oscar Romero was beatified on the 23rd of May, 2015, last year. His ministry, as Pope Francis um, described it, was distinguished by a particular attention to the most poor and marginalized. We see that now echoed also in um, the uh, Pope's work these days. In his early life, he was a carpenter, and that had a familiar ring to me. <laughs> and um, on April 4th, 1942, he was ordained in Rome. In 43, he was um, requested to return by his bishop back to El Salvador. And as he worked uh, in the ranks of the church. In 1974, he was appo appointed Bishop of the Diocese of Santiago de Maria, which was a poor and rural region. 
February 1977, Archbishop Romero was named. In terms of his religious convictions, what I was able to garner is that Archbishop Romero was horrified by the extent and the continuity of human rights violations that he was witnessing. One time there was an activist who uh, made a statement along the lines that there are two churches, the Church of the Rich and the Church of the Poor. And Romero objected to that and he said clearly these words are a form of demagogy and I will never admit a division of the church. He wanted to make sure the church in El Salvador stayed whole, that no division was perceived or encouraged. Upon being appointed Archbishop, he did not oppose directly the ruling class in El Salvador. And liberation theology from which that earlier comment uh, somewhat arose, uh, those priests who ascribed to it were actually disappointed by the appointment of Romero as the Archbishop because they felt he was a conservative and would not support liberation theology which had become one of the important foundations of the liberation movement in El Salvador. But then in 1977, a close friend of uh, Oscar Romero, uh, a Jesuit priest named Rutilio Grande, was murdered. And perhaps it takes something like this, where someone or something very close to you is taken away in a horrible way to really galvanize you, because that's what happened. He was deeply affected by the death of his friend. And Oscar Romero began to speak out against poverty, social injustice, assassinations, and the torture in a way he had not before. And the crescendo of his objections and admonishments to the ruling class kept on rising and rising until he gave that speech from which a portion uh, we just heard in that second slide. The very next day, he was assassinated. Archbishop Romero had appealed to the US, to President Carter, Jimmy Carter, to stop sending arms to the El Salvadoran government. And uh, the appeal was ignored, and the arms kept on flowing. When he met John Paul II, Pope John Paul II, in Europe on one of his trips, he said that it was growing increasingly difficult for him to support the Salvadoran government. This all set up the stage for the assassination, uh, where on the 23rd, he called on the Salvadoran soldiers as Christians to disobey orders to kill and obey God's higher order instead thou shalt not kill. Oscar Romero's funeral was huge. There was over 250,000 mourners. The state, um, true to its norm, actually set about with various actors to create chaos um, and violence at the funeral in an attempt to disrupt it. And still people lined up for miles to say their respect. So I'm giving you this from the perspective of a Muslim who researched the topic so that uh, he can speak to you about it today. I'm sure I'm just hitting the very few points that could be said here. To date, no one has been prosecuted for the assassination. Investigative journalists, several of them, reported that the paramilitary death squads uh, whose um, members assassinated Archbishop Romero were themselves killed by an elite uh, US CIA trained Salvadoran uh, special police unit. And sources within the military said uh, at some point that the men knew too much to be left alive.
On the 24th of March, 2010, the Salvadoran president, Mauricio Funes, offered an official apology. And that's big. That's an acknowledgement of the state's direct responsibility for the first time. So I actually want to move away from all of that history now and, and go into something else. Archbishop Romero was galvanized by all the murder and violence he saw, especially by his friends' uh, assassination. But when you read his writings and listen to his sermons, you understand that he had come to understand the huge link between repression and poverty and the violence that was ensuing. And when you Remember back to his comment to um, Pope John Paul when he met him that he could not support the ruling elite in El Salvador. You begin to see that he started to see that the circles of power within the regime that ruled uh, in El Salvador were at the source of this day in, day out, poverty, and a life of torture, really, for the people of El Salvador, which is what they were rebelling against. In fact, the violence perpetrated against them wasn't because they were being violent. They were just simply asking for their rights. And that's what they were um, punished for. Okay, so the detractors of liberation theology, which was all about standing for the poor and oppressed, accuse it of having roots um, in leftist and Marx Marxist ideology. So remember, this was still a time when the uh, capitalist, capitalism and communism, uh, the Cold War, was still um, hadn't waned yet. And... Uh, the hugest uh, risk for capitalism at that time was communism slash socialism. So we saw in the 50s in this country what happened when there began people to, who were thinking positively of socialism slash communism. Um, and we have to think about why there was such a violent backlash um, a strong legal action here didn't turn into violence, but definitely violent in many other countries. <coughs> what is it about capitalist regimes that make them so deadly, so violent when it comes to the poor saying that they identify with issues of human rights as described by socialism? And there's no doubt, there's lots of uh, very valid points about human rights and basic uh, rights of existence that socialism hit upon. That's why it received so much support at the beginning. So when you look at the church in El Salvador at the time that Oscar Romero became archbishop, Everything that was happening was happening under the eyes and ears of the church hierarchy in El Salvador. People who could have spoken like he did had not been. So it took a lot of courage for him to do that. But after the assassination of Archbishop Romero, 12 years of bloodshed ensued until eventually a peace was brokered. And those who were, those whose blood was spilt all those years, eventually got some of their rights and they became part of the 
power structure of the country. It's a shame that it took that long and that horrendous number of people who were abducted, tortured, dismembered, killed, raped, horrific things. But that's what happened. Now, today, we are well past that time. And yet, what we saw in El Salvador, and actually several other South American countries, has been repeating and is repeating as we stand or sit here now and talk. That same cycle is being repeated, has been repeated. So it's not stopping. And we have to think why. Now all of us live in America. We are definitely privileged with peace, tranquility. We can walk the streets. And we don't fear, fear, fear a sniper because yesterday we said something to somebody who didn't like it. But there are countries today, right now, where that's the case. And everybody's afraid to speak to anybody about anything. Fear permeates life completely. Many of those countries, we have uh, scenes like this poor boy every day. Um, I was born in Alexandria, Egypt. Over the last few years, you've probably all uh, heard of the upheaval that was happening in the, in the Middle East, and Egypt was one of them. And uh, I've been following everything that's been happening, but this scene is repeated every single day on the streets of Cairo and most of the major cities because the street children in Egypt are, who were actually a pawn, uh, one, of the, one of the tools that the military regime used, they still suffer like this. This picture is the norm for many of the street children in Cairo. They eat out of the garbage. They um, steal when they need to eat. Um, they take uh, any job they can get to make any, any amount of money, they'll, they'll sell some packets of uh, tissues on the streets. You see them a lot if you actually go to Cairo and you're driving, you stop at a traffic light or something. Although most people don't stop at the traffic light, they just keep on going. But, but if, if you do, they'll come right up to you with a packet of handkerchiefs. And most of us will actually buy the handkerchiefs. We've got five others in the back of the car. But we can't let that poor boy go because we can see on his face that this is part of his meal tonight. So where does Islam, my background, and liberation theology, which I think today in the Christian world should have even more grounds than it ever did before, if Jesus was about anything, Peace be upon him. He was about standing up for the poor and the weak. And yet, our country here, the most powerful country on earth today, with all the weaponry that we have, and all the various other means of power that we have, in our country, we have poor people more so than ever before. We have people in shelters. We have people homeless on the streets. Increasingly, every single year, the number goes up. Some of us, if we go to Philly or New York City, you'll, you'll walk past them every single day, somewhere. On the coldest nights, my daughter had to go to emergency one night, um, this last winter. When we took her to the emergency room, it was like 3.30 in the morning. It was freezing, somewhere in the teens. And uh, in, the, in the distance of about maybe 120 feet from the parking lot to the main entrance, three homeless. I walked past them, and, and I'm just thinking, OK, I'm walking, and I'm freezing. And these guys are lying on the, on the concrete, on the pavement. 
I just wondered. This is our country. So I'm here to tell you that as people who ascribe to faith in God, and I will say I don't care if you're Christian or Jewish or Muslim, the majority of us are failing because we're not doing enough. We're not doing enough. It does not take for one of us to be an archbishop with a pulpit to be able to speak against violence in all its forms, economic violence, social violence, physical violence. But the system that we have today in most of our societies is built on the use of violence to perpetuate a structure within our societies, which I bet you if any of the prophets, if Jesus or Muhammad or Moses were to walk our streets today, they would be shocked to see what is happening, to see the, the society we've accepted and are not doing enough about. So, for us as Muslims, Islam is, is not about praying in the masjid or in the mosque and then going out and doing our politics in, in a way that's separated from what we just did. In America and Western Europe, that's a problem. It's a big problem that Islam is involved in politics. And for years, I just couldn't understand. What's, what's the problem? Why is a parliamentarian who prays and is observant and doesn't partake of uh, usury and doesn't drink, why is that kind of a parliamentarian a problem for Europeans? Why do the French object so much? He's not going around uh, force converting anyone and he's an engineer, and he's discussing legislation that has to do with roads and procuring very expensive uh, raw inputs for that process and which bridge to build it. Why is his moral reference such a problem? And basically, I believe that over the last few years, when, when, when um, communism, when the wall fell, you remember that moment? The Berlin Wall fell. It was metaphorical, just like it was real. Because that moment is really wha where, in their hearts, uh, people who were in communist countries, they also felt that communism fell. Very symbolic moment. Um, at that moment, the <laughs> West, where we all live, the powers that be decided that the next opponent has to be Islam. And I couldn't figure out why. I mean, the oil countries are allies with all the Western world. The poor Muslim countries, they couldn't fire off a, <laughs> let alone weapons. I mean, I, the, the scale of the reaction just did not equate to the danger that was there. So in thinking about it over the last few years and reading, reading a lot for, for many people who wrote uh, on this point for me, I was led to this. It is because of what people who ascribe to liberation theology would have done to the structure of our societies. It is because what people who follow Islam in its correct pure form, without all the extremes and everything, would have done to the structure of those Muslim countries, and therefore the world. That's why it was such a danger. So when you look at the reference points for Muslims, the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, the biggest lesson that you draw, the biggest conclusion is that the Almighty through the Qur'an and through what he taught his prophet, 
how, he, how his prophet taught us the message, was first and foremost concerned with each one of us being an agent of justice. Um, to respect the rights of others before we claim our, our, our own rights. You can look at what Islam teaches as having to do with three main arenas. The interaction of people with people, the interaction of people with their environment, and the interaction of people with their creator. Those are the three main uh, corners of, of what Islam is all about. So, Muslims believe in the hereafter. When we physically die, the spirit that's in this body goes back to its maker and the body goes into the ground where what we were made of goes back to its initial state. I'm a biologist, so I'm going to ick you out a little bit. The worms digest us. Uh, and the insects digest us, and basically we, we, we dissolve in the ground, and we return to the elements from which we were made. God said in the Quran that he made men and women from the elements of the earth, from the mud of the earth. And that's what we return to. When you dig up a grave after it's done, you find just some bones, and everything else that's biological is gone. Where? Where did it go? It's in the worms and it's in the, in the soil and went back to its formal elements. The calcium became calcium again. Potassium is potassium. So that's the worldly life for us Muslims. That's the dunya. And the dunya is a word that refers to the smaller. That's literally what it means. It's the lower of the lives. The other life, the hereafter, is al-akhirah. And al-akhirah is an Arabic word which can be translated to mean the eternal, the final. So the spirit that God put inside of us when we were born into that fetus that was uh, carried in the womb for nine months, that spirit is removed from that physical body and that's why we can keep people alive with machines and hospitals, but they're dead. The body the heart can keep beating, the organs can keep functioning, the blood can keep flowing. We can force air in and out, looks like they're breathing, but they're dead. The soul has gone. So that is the first one. It's an aspect of worldly life, dunya. The second is creation. When God put mankind on earth, the Qur'an tells a lot of stories about this. Um, but it was mostly a test for us. Because we were given the one thing that most other creation or all other creation does not have to the same extent that we have. This brain, this intellect. We are the only species that can move mountains. We are the only species that can dig tunnels under oceans. We're the only species that can wipe out other species. We're the only species that can, with nuclear bombs, annihilate this whole world as God created it. That's our test. Because it was a trust. It was a trust. It is a trust. So every single day when we wake up and we get into our cars, without having made the slightest effort were we to have the means, we didn't make the slightest effort to change from a fossil fuel vehicle to something less damaging. We're contributing to the damage of the environment and we will be asked about that. Right now, most of us are captive to the system. The system is fossil fuels, get in your car, turn on the ignition and drive on the highways. Some other societies have gone a few steps ahead of us. They have public transit that is based on renewable energy. We don't. What's this got to do with Oscar Romero? Some of you are thinking about this now, uh, right now. It has a lot to do with it. 
because it's the poverty that resulted out of the greed of capitalism, the same greed of capitalism that results in fossil fuels that are destroying this environment that God calls us to stand up to. We were about to have a climate change summit a few months back. Climate activists, many of them faith-based from all, all over the world, were going to go over there to Paris and uh, attend and uh, complain and make their voices heard to those who make decisions. Well, none of that was allowed to happen because of the, the attacks on Paris. The whole city was locked down. Everybody who was there to protest, the police had very strict orders. Don't. You're not allowed to. So one has to wonder how many of the industries that would be impacted by the mass movement of people to force a change in the system and affect their pockets perhaps had something to do with this. This isn't just some crazy Muslim talking here. This is things I've read from uh, investigative reports were, that were conducted by non-Muslims, Europeans, French, American, Danish. It's just really odd. And the third and last one is the relationship with God. And God tells us in the Quran that there is no compulsion in religion. So as Muslims, we are supposed to tell people about the message of God. We tell them about Adam. We tell them about Abraham. We tell them about Solomon, about David, about Moses. We tell them about Jesus, and we tell them about Muhammad. For us, it's, it's one chain of people that God sent so that the rest of us don't go astray. But that's God's dominion. Beyond telling them, that's it. That's where we're supposed to stop. Yes, throughout history there have been people like, for example, the Spanish Inquisition, Inquisition. They didn't exactly preach Jesus' words when they were convincing the Moors that uh, they should become Christians. If you know that history, it was horrific. But same thing on the Muslim side. There have always been extremists who took it well beyond where it should go. So, in terms of examples right now, I alluded to that before. There are military juntas ruling countries, just like the history of South America of recent past. I think there was a military junta in Chile, in Argentina, in Brazil, in El Salvador, in Guatemala. I, I might be able to name every single country in South America, and they would have had a military junta. And yet, those are the same countries f uh, based on whom we got the phrase banana republic. Did you think before why that phrase came up? Have you heard of Chiquita Banana? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a huge company, it's a big company, it's a food company. But the, the, the countries in South America where Chiquita Banana was operating were basically like its plantation. And who enforced that system? It was the military junta. So there is this formula. And you find it regardless of the language, regardless of the religion, regardless of the culture. You will find it all over the world, the same formula. There's a ruling elite. Have you heard of the 1%? Something like that. And then there's a small number of wealthy businessmen. The ruling elite don't have to be businessmen, but they often are. There is a judiciary and a police force that's on the side of the system. And then there's a religious reference, like a silent church or an Azhar head who stands next to the generals all the time. Uh, a source of religious admonition to the public to be quiet and accept their rulers and not rock the boat. It's always there even if it's a Buddhist who's speaking, not a Muslim or a priest. So the tools of control are the media, t 
telephone and internet because they have to listen to what you're saying. The pharmaceutical industry because they control through making sure that the right medicines are always available in the market. And the food sector because the poor have to remain hungry. It's one of the ways that you control them. So for me, this is just another form of the struggle between good and evil. Let's go back to Pharaoh. When Moses came to Pharaoh in the Quran, it tells us that Moses told Pharaoh about the message he had from God. And he wanted to take the people of Israel out of the bondage that they had been in under Pharaoh. And he was willing to bring Pharaoh with him to worship God. And Pharaoh refused. And he said that you're, gonna, you're basically talking about changing my entire system. I'm going to lose my power. And that's why he opposed him. And in his own person, he could order soldiers to kill, but Mos Moses had a status amongst the people. So this had to be handled in the right way. So he called his advisors. He called the wealthy of the court. And the system was set into motion to control Moses just like the system was set into motion to control Archbishop Romero. If you dissent, they'll deal with you one way or another. So, when the followers of Prophet Muhammad were sent from the deserts of Mecca to uh, the Persian Empire, to the Roman Empire, and to uh, the Egyptian uh, the, the, the Coptic rulers there. Coptic rulers who were actually under the repression of Christian Rome. If you remember that history. But when they walked into the court of those kings, those pharaohs of their own, right? They were asked, what brings you out here? And these were men who were Bedouins. They came out of the desert after a long ride and they were all dusty and wearing these flowing robes that may be torn and not clean. And here's the king of Persia sitting on his throne with a two, 400 uh, foot long uh, red carpet. And, and this man walks up to him and he says, accept Islam, release your people from your bondage. And the king of Persia is like, who, who, who do you think you are coming here telling me this? And the man said, we are a people who received a message from God. And our prophet taught us that we were sent to take people out of the bondage to others and bring them into the vastness of serving God. In other words, not to be slaves to each other. And yet to serve the Almighty who created us while protecting everybody's rights. In other words, no more kings of Persia. <laughs> that's what it was about. And that's what it still is about. If, forget Islam for a second, if Christianity was to stand up for the poor and the oppressed today, you would be the primary target of today's system the greedy capitalists. When we talk about the 1%, and it's not just me, it's, it's mainstream non-Muslims here in America, they're talking about the 1%, they're the ones who educated me. Um, when you read the description of how the 1% live, what they actually own, what they control, you have to wonder, why? They're still men and women like us. They can only eat so much. They can only drink so much. They can only wear one set at a time. <laughs> and they can't change them that quickly to justify what's in all those huge closets. When do they wear all of this? <laughs> Imelda Marcus, do you remember that history? Imelda Marcus had more shoes in her closet than most of the people living in the uh, capital of the city had shoes. 
Why? When is enough enough? So, really, it's greed. It's the same old story. It just has different clothes on, different faces, but it's the same system. It's the same old story. A small group wanting to take everything so that they can, con and to do that, they have to control everyone else at any means, uh, w with whatever means possible, at any price. So, <coughs> this sentence here that uh, Oscar Romero said, I will not tire of declaring that if we truly want an effective end to the violence, and that's what he was focused on, just stop the killing. We must eliminate the violence that lies at the root of all violence. Structural violence. Look at our country today. I'm not talking about Egypt. I'm not talking about Bangladesh. I'm not talking about failed states. I'm talking us here. The last time I looked at the uh, uh, pictorial dis uh, uh, description of our budget, very close to 50% of it was on weapons. When you look at the trains in Japan and the trains in America, you think that things were flipped over. It was America that was hit with the atomic bomb and Japan that came out victorious. Our trains look like they're from the Stone Age compared to Japan's trains. Why is that? Our streets are falling to pieces. Our bridges are dangerous and many, many uh, bridges have been examined and actually they're a high risk to be going over. The infrastructure of, of the country as a whole needs a lot of spending to be safe to use. Flint, Michigan, that's just a symptom. That, that's, I mean, there are so many Flint, Michigans around the country. And yet, we're the richest country in the world. Where's all that money going? There's a lot wrong. So, it's, it's very similar to what Oscar Romero was talking about. And that structural vi violence, the social injustice, the exclusion of citizens from the management of their country. We've all heard about Citizens United. Here we are in, in a lecture talking about Oscar Romero in a religious uh, studies center and we're talking politics, God forbid. But Citizens United is a problem because as a result, there's all this money from big corporations and it affects people's per perceptions of the candidates because of the, the deluge of ads to change your, op your mind and your opinion without the, uh, the candidates themselves being able to correct the situation by talking to you and telling you what they really believe. So how far are we really from the problems that Oscar Romero identified as the source of the violence? A lot of the people who support some of the really radical far-right candidates in this election season, you look at their problems, it has to do with poverty, it has to do with disease, it has to do with finding somebody to blame for their very poor lot in life. So the system, again, is manipulating the situation. So, there's a lot of aspects to all of this. And if we take Oscar Romero's speech to be something that encourages, uh, the, it, as an example to follow, he stood up and said a few words to oppose in a loud voice what was happening. 
So given all the different aspects of what is wrong and is happening in our countries and in other countries today, what each of us should ask is this. Oscar Romero is dead. He's a martyr. And on the day that he stands before God, he's going to have that uh, to speak for him. What are each one of us going to say? So let's say um, my time is tonight when I stand before the Almighty to answer for the 50-some years of you, I've lived thus far, what am I going to be able to say as I tried this and this and this? Each one of us has to think about that question because it's when we have that concern in our hearts. It doesn't matter if you are a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim. If you want to stand before God and have a list of things that you were trying to do to make the world a better place, ask yourself today, while you still can do something, because you're still breathing, before the day comes when you're not breathing anymore, and it's over. So, if you take it from that perspective, there's healthcare access, there is access to healthy, wholesome food, there is food labeling, there is uh, talking about school lunches, there is um, energy and transportation. Choose your area and be an activist. Because if you don't, and if I don't, then this happens. This happens because within a society, there's a group that wants too much, and it's, it's prepared to have this happen, Elan, that toddler who washed up on the shores of Turkey because where he used to live the, the ruling elite and the military junta just don't want to give it up. They don't want to give the country and its resources up to the people. The people of Syria when they rose up, uh, what, three, four years ago at this point, they were demonstrating in the streets. There were no weapons. They were, say, they were just simply saying to Bashar al-Assad, go, get out of office, leave us. We want a different person to rule us. That's all. They would have taken somebody from his family, but not him. And the response was gunfire, bombardment, killing, torture. And this is the result. Okay, so when I first came in 1980, I heard this. Think locally, think globally and act locally. I didn't really understand it until years later. Do what you can. Think of global problems and do what you can about them locally and internationally. Be part of something. Today, if you want to have an impact across the Atlantic, you can because of the internet. How many of us are instead following the Kardashians or whatever? So the tools are at our hands to do a lot. And yet, how are we choosing to use them? So, there is also another saying, which is much older. United we stand, divided we fall. When I try to do something on my own, and I'll come to an example of that now, it's just me. But when Jesus' followers got more followers. Rome accepted Christianity. Rome. That's like, that's like us Muslims taking the White House. That's, that's huge. It's the power of working together. Okay, so now, if the fight is between good and evil, and what's at stake is literally the earth, if you take the cumulative effect of human population, regardless of borders, regardless of nation states, regardless of uh, language, the human species, the impact we have had and are having on the one vessel that is carrying us through space, it's called Earth, is huge. Doing something about pollution and climate change is part of being a person of faith. 
if you claim to be a person of faith and you stand by and allow the same story to happen day in, day out, without any change, I challenge that you have faith. Because God would not like to see that. If you were before Jesus today and he saw you consuming and living a life of consumption as most of us do because that's the system we're in. We have to change the system and the values of the system so that the day in and day out activities have a different impact. But right now we are participants in it. We, our households generate trash that ends up in the South Pacific in that huge plastic, floating plastic trash island. It's killing species, it's changing biosystems, it's horrific. Okay, so if we work together, maybe we can make a difference. This violence that we're seeing has a lot to do with this verse. Because in the Quran, God says, we're not God to check one set of people by means of another. That means you standing up in the face of someone who's carrying out tyranny and you say no. And you physically stop them. There would surely have been pulled down monasteries. Yes, that's, that word is in the Quran. Churches, it's in the Quran. Synagogues and mosques in which the name of God is commemorated in abundant measure. We're Muslims, we're reading this text, and God is telling us to stand up to oppression and injustice because churches and synagogues could be wrecked, as well as our mosques. Our message is to stand up for all violence and all injustice, whether it's against Muslims or not. Because as we now see, if we let it go against the non-Muslims, the effect will circle around and come back to us one day. So that's how I understand being a person of faith. So my choice was to be an activist on faith basis. But I do not know how to pick up a gun, let alone hold a rifle and shoot, and I don't know who to shoot at. <laughs> so what can I do to make a change? to effect a difference. So I chose to do something with those 16 to 18 years of scientific research and studying and looking at books for hours and start a farm. A briefer. I, in those years, I learned and I earned degrees and one of the things I learned, all my learning was here, I learned that we scientists and researchers have been turned into cheap labor for big business. And here's how they do it. Up until the late 70s, the federal government gave federal research grants generously. But then things dried up. And the predominant source of research grants, and those of you who are young but might go into academia, this is how it works. You have to publish. If you want your position to be guaranteed with tenure, you have to publish. And you don't publish by just being yourself. You have to have graduate students, a team that does the work with you, for you, and you publish. So the companies come in. I saw this in Arizona. I saw it in Texas. And it, I saw it in Rutgers. I even saw it in Egypt. The companies come in and they say, um, we want you to research X, Y, and Z. And here's a grant of $200,000. The principal investigator hears this number. Within seconds, he's calculated the stipend for how many graduate students he's going to have, how much the benefit's going to be uh, for each one of them, uh, how many hours of work he's going to be able to get, and how many publications. So the company comes at the end of the grant period and says, we've seen your interpretation of the results. They weren't exactly what we were hoping for. And after a couple of meetings, the results are interpreted closer to what the company wants. 
next year's funding is guaranteed, and some graduate students are upset. The professor gets his publications. Years later, he gets his tenure. But that's how the companies have turned professors into spokespersons for their products. It's by controlling the funding. We have to get the federal funding back. If that doesn't happen, they will continue to compromise the ethics of researchers. So I saw that happen within my field, agriculture. Um, and we, we know, as scientists, we know that when pesticides are used, they break down to an extent, not completely. The pesticide residue that's tested for, that is a crime because it takes decades and decades before it, it washes away or goes down further enough in the soil that it's not a problem. It will end up in the water cycle. It will end up in our food or in our air, and all of us are going to be exposed to it. We know that. But there's a risk if we speak up, like Romero, we'll be aggressed against as well. Maybe they won't shoot us, but there will be consequences. So there's not much that I, a single person, can do uh, against this system. Um, the Union of Concerned Scientists and other groups like it is trying. But we have a very small microphone compared to the, the airwaves that uh, big corporations can use. They're, they're on the internet, they're on TV, they're on cable, they're in printed news. The, the message that they're convincing everybody is that, no, no, these products are safe, don't worry. Have you ever seen their workers in the fields when they're spraying these pesticides? Go on the internet and search for pictures. Every one of them is wearing a hazmat suit, a mask on their face to make sure they're not breathing the fumes, and they look like they're going into warfare. Because they are. They're spraying poisons that kill the insects. Now, do you think that sweet strawberry did not absorb some of that toxic chemical that they sprayed? Absolutely. Does it come off when you wash it? No. It's inside the tissue of the strawberry. So conventional agriculture, conventional, see the word? That's how we describe it now. That's the norm. It's become the norm. Anybody here have grandmothers that still remember when they had a garden? They didn't spray like that. That was conventional back then, not to spray. So to spray has become the norm because we were told that's the way to produce food. It doesn't have to be that way. The Food and Agriculture Organization, and that's a scientific research organization, as well as development, has repeatedly stated that to save the world's soils and the world's environment in terms of food production, mass-scale organic production of food has to be adopted. They didn't say should be, they said has to be. To protect the soils and to protect the, the, the ecosystem, that's what we need to do. Because the way conventional agriculture is taking us right now is to ruin the the fields that um, were the site of the Green Revolution in India, where Norman Borlaug's uh, wheat and corn that, was, that relied on the pesticide and, and uh, herbicide industry um, bloomed so great for so many years. Now, research it. Those areas are mostly desert now. And the reason is the soils were killed. They became inert and the fertility was lost, as the organic matter was lost. So, this is what I chose to be an activist on, and I am doing this to please God. I know that this is not the best way to uh, get a lot of money. It isn't. It's a long, arduous struggle, and um, not everybody understands, but I enjoy very much talking with whoever will stand at the farm stand with me for a few minutes and talk. Because all of a sudden, when they come back the next week for their share of produce, 
They start telling me about what they found out in between, those seven days in between. And, and I'm looking at a person who's going wild, and I'm like, yeah, I know. They're discovering what I have been discovering. But that's what I'm trying to do. So the farm for me is about those moments when I can talk to people and educate them so that I can put the seed in their mind that what they see is not what should be. That they should look behind the story that they're told. Dig a little deeper to find out what the reality is. Because it's not pretty. So, what I'm trying to do with the farm, I'll just summarize this so that I can take some questions, is one, organic food has been around for decades, right? But it's been where? Wegmans, Whole Foods, places where if you shop for a month, you won't be able to sustain it for two or three. Because the price is high. Great food, wonderful food, but it's just not affordable. Why? Because it's a business where they're looking at the margin. It's based on the bottom line. Yes, there are values that are part of the product that they sell you, but they're making a heck of a pro profit. So the, the average person can't afford it. So access to uh, uh, healthy food is, is uh, the, the prohibition often is the cost. And then the other thing is um, how many whole foods are like near your house? One? Two? Do you drive maybe 40 miles away? Something like that. And yet, how many McDonald's or Burger King are there? W would it be fair to say maybe 10, 15? within five miles of your house, the system is wrong. The people who would go to buy organic from Whole Foods might spend on a meal that's before it's prepared, $15. And that meal will feed two or three people. A family of five can go for $15 to the value menu in Burger King or McDonald's and feed everybody and they go home feeling full, especially the kids. Mom wants to kid, feed the kids before they go home. Every mom wants to. But she's only got $15. You tell her, go eat healthy. I can't afford it. Economics. So something has to give. That's what I'm trying to do. So I make my margin a small sliver. My business partners don't necessarily like it, but that's, that was the foundation of the business when they came in. Um, so, food as medicine. How many of us rely on a regular dosage of pills that are next to our bed, in, in the vanity, in the bathroom, or somewhere in, your, in the kitchen? Every day, you have to take these pills. Most of us do. Well, if we eat right, and we live a healthy lifestyle, move more. Get off the couch. You don't need to be sitting for hours at the TV or the PlayStation or on your laptop or on your smartphone and just doing this. Get up and walk. Get up and run. Get up and do some gardening. Be physically fit. Be physically active. It will add years to your life. And then eat healthier. Anything that does not spoil, and that's not my statement, Michael Pollan said this, anything that does not spoil is not real food. So if it sits on the shelf and doesn't go bad for days and days and days, something's wrong. Don't eat that. Eat what goes <laughs> bad because that's real food. So eat unprocessed, eat fresh, eat raw as much as you can. That's what these bodies were designed for. The creator created it so that it eats a banana, not you know, the, the powder that they sell and it has some banana in it, but 
you read the list of ingredients and like there's so many chemicals added to make it preserved and this and that. Eat raw, eat healthy. Um, so you hear a lot about social responsibility for corporations. Usually what that means is that they, um, whether it's a bank or a hospital or something, they, they pick something that they can do, give something away to the poor, whatever, and um, that's the social responsibility that's practiced. That's good. I want more of it, but that's not really what, what the country needs. We've got to look at who's hurting the most. Have you heard of food deserts? Have you heard of the, um, the inner city not having uh, grocery stores? Okay, we have a huge problem today because we have been told you don't need the local farms anymore. The trucks are gonna bring it from Mexico and California. No problem, it's gonna be cheap, inexpensive. It's always gonna be here. Um, and uh, we have this huge population in a very small area. Now, Sandy hit us. Hurricane Sandy hit us directly. And we lived through the, the experience. The trucks couldn't come through. Uh, whether it was for gasoline or to replenish the supermarkets, because the, the roads were blocked. There was trees down everywhere. There was uh, road damage. There was accidents. There was... Well, all of a sudden, everybody's looking, where can they buy food locally? And guess what? Those who had f local farms were able to get eggs. They were able to get vegetables. They were able to live and eat. Everybody else who ate out of a box was in trouble. Um, lastly, every day I look in the mirror and I see all this white hair <laughs> and I keep thinking, I'm running out of time. That's literally what I'm thinking. I'm running out of time because there's a lot I need to do. There's a lot I want to do. And there's a lot that I feel humanity needs me to do. So I keep thinking. Who's going to inherit this? And I don't mean the business, I don't mean the land. Who's going to inherit this? This mission. It has to be those who are young like you. So I try through the farm to say, farming isn't uh, an occupation for someone who's just got uh, a blade of grass and walking around with uh, britches and stuff. No, no. You can do hydroponics. You can have uh, greenhouses that are, um, that are um, just like the tropics in the <coughs> middle of winter if you use shipping containers and the right environmental control and renewable energy. You can, you can uh, control pH and have uh, organic hydroponics. You can grow in soil. You can grow outside of soil. You can grow with mist. You can grow on tops of uh, roofs of buildings. You can grow in the basements. And that's food. That's security. We talk about national security. Food is one of the most important aspects. And yet, it's important also for social stability. Because I still remember Katrina and New Orleans. I still remember the cries of pain and the people being photographed from the helicopters. No food, no water, nobody to rescue them. When they're hungry, the system breaks down, society breaks down. Then you have things like the LA riots. People are angry and hungry. So it's a small thing, but that's what I'm trying to do. My point is this, I just, I'll, I'll end with this. Um, do something. Think about what God has given you and do something. That's my vision, that the farm through the community, becomes a place where the youth can flourish and explore their entrepreneurship and grow a local food e economy that's nice and strong and vibrant, and yet addresses the environment, social inequities, food access. So I wrote a very carefully drafted operating agreement so nobody can change the business model after I'm gone. But that's what I'm trying to do. So whether it's following the steps of Oscar Romero, 
or the many unnamed Oscar Romeros in the prisons around the world today or in the graves or those like me who talk too much. Do something. That's basically my message. Do something. Thank you. Um, no, it was the culmination of, who's good at math, 1998 to 2007, how many years is that? Nine years, so it took about nine years. I started to think about doing something, I had various ideas, and uh, by the time he chose it was the right time. It was this. What keeps you doing the work? What keeps me doing the work? The Quran. Because as Muslims, we're instructed to read it and live by it. So. I've been very busy the last few years. I haven't read as much as I should, but I still remember what I did read before. And basically, um, it's the fear of standing before the Almighty and not being able to say, I did what I could. That motivates me. And then there's a few other things, like when I see the kids who come out to the farm, that motivates me. Because I look at them, they can be fr uh, kids from my family, kids from relatives or friends or neighbors or, or the customers. And I, I look at them and I smile because I see the hope. I, I see the future and I say, maybe. So that, that keeps me going too. A little corny, maybe, but that's really how it is. Someone back there. What needs to happen for your methods to replace conventional farming? Bernie Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious. Um, people who think like Bernie Sanders they need to get in the game. Because look, the system didn't just poof, materialize one day. It came about through consistent hard work by a certain set or group of our society. They're part of us. They may be relatives of yours or mine, but they're part of the system. They worked together very diligently to craft it just like it is. For things to change, we have to get into township councils, municipality councils, we have to get into state government, we have to get into federal government. The FDA has more bureaucrats with clout than any president has. They're called career civil servants. Elections come, presidents go, they are there. There is a show that came from Britain. Go back and look it up. It's called Yes Minister. Watch one or two episodes of Yes Minister. You'll see what I'm saying. We have to get in the game. If we're not there, the laws will be written. If we are there, the laws will be rewritten. So you decide. Basically, it can happen. But the youth have to get off the chairs, get off the couch, get off the seats, and get involved. 
Yes. Okay. I'm still working on that to get it to where I'm satisfied. I have had Jews who want to work with me. I have had some Muslims who want to work with me. We're always last. To everything, we come last. <laughs> um, and I've had lots of different Christian denominations. Some Catholic, mostly Protestant, come who want to work with me. And basically what everybody's realizing is this. I'm offering some, everybody a piece of land which is as pristine as I could have made it. We did work on it to get to where it is now. Um, and it's available for everybody.